At every level, the planet of Nakare 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Pariahs. Last episode, we left off at the Spinal Mountains, a receding mountain range that holds a bizarre and isolated ecosystem with montane specialists and migratory species being primarily present in the mountain range. This episode, we will examine the monsoon scarlands. The scarlands are largely open forests with wide areas of grassland which are hammered by storms during the wet season and scorched during the dry season. The climate and monsoon cycle is similar to the conditions seen in Southern Asia on Earth, where oceanic winds blow rain-heavy clouds coastward into the continent during the wet season, and western winds blow dry air from the mountains coastward, driving away most storms from watering the parched land below. The only water remaining year-round are in the rivers fed by the spinal mountains and a few flooded forests caused by the activities of some of the specialized species of the environment. These areas tend to turn into claw-shaped lakes which give the region its name. The Scarlands are bordered by the spinal mountains to the west, the global ocean to the east, the Great Forest to the south, and a large swath of tropical savanna to the north. Even with these oases, many species do not remain in the Scarlands for very long. The rapidly changing cyclical environment only leaves a brief period where animals from other regions can come to feed or breed. The migrants are primarily birds and mammals, with a good chunk of these groups leaving either during the dry or wet season for more reasonable climates. The majority of these short-term guests are birds, and most of those birds are descendants of the Muscovy duck. More ducks, false rails, and parian crakes have members who spend their nesting season in the Scarlands. False rails in particular spend a very short nesting season near the end of the wet season to avoid the worst of the storms and still exploit the bounty of food. All three of these rather global groups have some more specialized subspecies who remain year-round though they are outnumbered by the migrant species significantly. Moorducks, false rails, and parian crakes can be found quite easily in almost any terrestrial environment on the planet, since they are migratory generalists that eat whatever nutrients they can find. Another avian visitor is the Iranian giant shoebill, though this visitor is not here to reproduce. They come to the Scarlands during the wet season to feed, as their island homeland can't support their populations all the time. Addressed before in the Irene episode, these apex insular predators are a menace to small birds and mammals alike. The only year-round local bird is terror in its own right. 
or more accurately, a raider. The raiding frigate bird is a rather surprising specimen, notably because no siloform birds were brought to Piraeus at all. The raiding frigate bird, despite its appearance, is actually a ring-billed gull descendant. Their coloration is what gives their ancestry away with their white underbelly and speckled, stripped backs. They are prolific nest raiders who will harass and steal food from many of the migratory bird species. Their own breeding season, which takes place during the early dry season, is often a colorful affair as males inflate their bright orange guller sacs that contrast their black heads that they use to attract mates. These birds tend to nest on cliff sides or in treetops. The savannas of the north are most common to be found here in the wet season, and some species will migrate down from the spinal mountains when there is a lack of food up there. The trees and plants generally found in the Scarlands are smaller than their counterparts of other regions. This is primarily due to the harsh environment during the dry season, as well as massive flooding during the wet season and animal activity. The clearest example of this is the normally massive, towering orange tree. Many in the Scarlands do not reach the 40 to 50 meter heights that their northern rainforest brethren do. These trees notably become smaller the further south you go. Even stunted, these trees are still the largest in the region by far and provide a stable food source for many local species. As even at this reduced size, they still produce massive fruit, which are quite larger compared to their old, domestic counterpart. While the towering orange struggles, other plants will try to exploit this gap. The elevated megafig is the main competition of the towering orange in the Scarlands. They have the opposite situation to the oranges, as megafigs in the south tend to be taller than those in the north. But they are also not present in the northern rainforest. It seems they are uniquely placed to exploit the local weakness of the towering oranges. Elevated megafigs are defined by their tangled roots who push the main trunk far above the soil. This was mainly an adaptation to survive the constant flooding during the wet season. Outside of the flooded forests, though, the main food source is angel grass. Angel grass is a goosegrass descendant that has completely taken over the floodplains and spaces in between the pocket forests. They have become extremely specialized for the Scarland region. First of all was the development of a preference for wet environments, allowing them to still grow and survive even if completely flooded. This is usually a time of extreme growth for these grasses with the potential of spreading their seeds. Like their ancestors, the seeds tend to stick to passing animals. This is typically mammals, though in the floodplains, it is not unheard of for fish to become the primary seed disperser. During the dry season though, the angel grass drops most of its leaves. Most of their nutrients are kept in their roots. So the quick shave when things start to get dry help keep the plant alive. It also secondarily provides great nesting material 
for many of the migratory bird species. In the more arid southern edge of the Scarlands, stands of drowsy thyme break up much of the angel grass. These thyme descendants are hardy, especially the ones in the Scarlands who have deeper roots than those found in the south. This allows for nutrients to be saved during the dry season, where the branches will shrivel up and look unappetizing to grazers, with only the main green woody trunk showing any signs of life. During the wet season, many grazers make their return, and the drowsy thyme can no longer afford to play dead. Their main defense against grazers is their ability to grow quickly when water is plentiful. Some can double size within a week, and they are equally prolific reproductively. The nectar they produce is incredibly attractive, to the point that thyme even uses it to attract pollinators for seed dispersal, in addition to regular pollination. In the highlands of the Scarlands, Stands of alpine tuber fern begin to take over as the environment is more consistent like the mountains they usually call home. These specimens can be found further down the mountain due to its ability to drop its leaves during hard times, seeming to be a prerequisite for survival in a land that faces drought for a good half of the year. As these trunked ferns were covered last episode, we will be moving on to more local species. Though many of these previous plants have developed ways to survive the dry season, some have simply developed so that the next generation will survive. The holiday lotus is one such plant. It has hardy seeds that can survive underground for years should the wet season ever be delayed. Though this was a trait its lotus ancestors already possessed, what the holiday lotus has developed is a truly massive flower, with some individuals measuring 35 centimeters across, making it the largest flower in the Scarlands. Along with the bright red petals and yellow center, it resembles a seasonal ornament. The sheer size of the flower attracts more than just the regular pollinators. The flower is used as a platform sometimes for some basking amphibious vertebrates who will inadvertently become pollinators themselves. This happens more often in the more permanent flooded forests where the lotus will be present year round and generally go by their alternative common name, the Fire Lotus. Fungi are also fairly prevalent, as with most environments, though the most common is the tuber mimic mushroom. These mushrooms actually originate from the island of Irene, and are known there as tuber oyster mushrooms. The reason for the two different common names is based on the region they are found in, with the oyster mushrooms preferring to those found exclusively on the island, and mimic mushrooms referring to those found on the mainland. Traveling through spore dispersal, the wind has spread these humble mushrooms far and wide across both Lucindo and Belcraic. Even with the different name, however, they are fundamentally very similar species as the mushroom seen in episode 5. Amphibians have done quite well for themselves in the Scarlands. Nights are often filled with croaks and songs of many frogs and toads, though they are extremely similar to their ancestors as they mainly live year-round in the flooded forests. The only amphibian who has truly changed to fully exploit the environment of the Scarlands is the oddly named half-and-half -half salamander. 
these odd-spotted salamander descendants express some of the most extreme examples of sexual dimorphism in any vertebrate on Parias. Males are terrestrial as adults and travel between the temporary bodies of water during the wet season. They are almost identical to their ancestors as they live rather similar lives. The females, however, are neotenic and retain their gills and mottled brown coloration from their larval stage. The females are also much larger at a massive 30 centimeters long compared to the 18 centimeters of males. They have developed this odd arrangement due to the fact they live in a more chaotic environment than most other species of amphibians, requiring them to specialize for the floodplains as opposed to the flooded forests. So the half and half hibernate in burrows with specialized mucous membranes to keep their bodies moist during the dry season. Once the rain returns, males will begin moving from flooded pool to flooded pool in search of a female and eating any invertebrate they come across. The females make their burrows at the bottom of these temporary bodies of water, feeding mainly on small fish and invertebrates awaiting the arrival of a male to breed with. These pools dry up quickly during the dry season, so the larvae need to grow up quickly. Their appetites are so voracious that they occasionally become cannibals and eat their smaller siblings. The survivors, however, are usually more than large enough to make a burrow of their own and seal themselves away until the rains return. Where there are amphibians, usually their most common food source, invertebrates, can also be found in great numbers. Most notably is the large variety of spiders that call the Scarlands home, largest of which, at an impressive 10 centimeters, is the lemon-bellied grass runner, which is a descendant of the quite venomous Brazilian wandering spider. Grass runners are nocturnal pursuit predators who will take any other invertebrate and even some small vertebrates. Their yellow underbellies are used as a warning display similar to their ancestors to advertise their high venom. They are one of the few species in the Scarlands who actually prefer the dry season and generally have population booms during this time. This is mainly due to the fact that they require dry ground under a rock or grasses to place their egg sacs. Whilst the lemon-bellied grass runner prefers drier environments, its close relative, the yellow flood floater, as the name suggests, is far more fond to wet environments. This yellow-backed spider is another wandering spider descendant and is quite venomous, though at 6 centimeters it is no match for its landlocked cousin. Though this is not much of an issue, as the flood floater specializes in hunting aquatic prey. It uses specialized hairs on its body that trap air, allowing it to breathe for short periods of time during a dive. It will target aquatic invertebrates and small fish before returning to the surface and feeding on their catch while floating on the surface of the water. These arachnids spend almost their whole lives on the water and will usually only climb plants to deposit egg sacs. Both species are rather nomadic due to the fact their ranges shrink and grow depending on the season. In comparison, some spiders prefer to be more sedentary, the oni-faced spider being chief among them. 
A descendant of the common house spider, only females build the webs, with males traveling from web to web looking for a mate. Though the webs of the oni-faced spider are far more clean as opposed to its ancestors' cobwebs, becoming more convergent with those of orb weavers. Their most impressive feature are the demonic faces on their abdomens that give them their names. The larger females have a pattern and spikes that make it look like a smiling red oni, while the larger males have an orange sad demon on their abdomens. The oni-faced spider likely developed these bizarre features to advertise their stronger poison and keep predators away. Arachnids may be the most diverse invertebrates in the Scarlands, but they are far from the most numerous. That title goes to the Ember Ants. Descended from Fire Ants, the Ember Ants have retained their ancestral reputation for aggression, with their sting being infamous across the Scarlands for being quite painful. They prefer living in the drier regions of the Scarlands, as they make their colonies underground. Like their ancestors, they are quite capable during floods, as they make living rafts that keep the brood and queen safe. Their burrowing skills are also some of the best as they can quickly re-establish themselves once the rain stops and their rafts make landfall. These survival tactics have made them quite populous in the Scarlands, with many colonies having several satellite nests. Another Hymenopteran who can be found in the Scarlands is the Nurse Wasp. This antisocial bee was covered back in the Crimson Desert episode, but here in the Scarlands, they are also the primary pollinator for many of the plants in the Scarlands, especially the drowsy thyme. Nurse wasps actually swarm less often here than anywhere else, and this is mainly due to the flooded forests that can keep plants blooming for longer than other places with dry seasons. The true arthropod king of the skies, in the Scarlands at least, is the Lucindan Pegafly. This massive dragonfly descendant is reminiscent of those during the Earth's Carboniferous period. With a 9 inch wingspan, the Pegafly is one of, if not the, largest flying arthropod on Lucindo. With their large size and barbed limbs, they have a preference for hunting spiders in the Scarlands. Their barbed limbs help keep the arachnid's fangs away from the main body while the pegafly feeds. These oversized dragonflies live primarily in the flooded forests. A mammal that calls the monsoon-covered Scarlands home is the bizarre Turim antelope, which has abandoned its speedy adaptations for a lifestyle of high browsing. Resembling a cross between a giraffe and a moose, these bizarre creatures are descendants of the pronghorn. With thicker legs and longer necks, they can easily consume the leaves off the giant trees in the region. They are among the tallest animals of Lucindo, with males passing heights of 4 meters and females passing heights of 3 meters. They are mainly limited in size due to the fact that the females have to carry a large baby inside of them whilst pregnant, causing the female to be weighed down significantly during pregnancy. Most Turim antelope wander in herds consisting of one male, around four to eight females, and their calves. Bachelor herds are also very common, 
consisting of males that have yet to claim a harem of their own. These animals have little to fear as adults, so their herding behavior is likely due to social adaptations not forgone from their ancestral past. The Lucindan wandering sheep, common across the continent, can also be found here. This is one of their favorite locations during the wet season, being a half-year bounty of grasses for them. Hundreds upon hundreds of wandering sheep can be found on the Scarlands if someone was to walk around for just a single day. But since they are incredibly common and prone to wandering into other regions, they will likely return in yet another episode. They get along well with other herbivores in the regions that they find themselves in. Another animal that has featured before is the Marauder Opossum, a 20 kilogram badger-like beast that is infamous on the continent for eating literally anything it comes across that it can fit down its mouth. They have an atrophied, stubby tail and striped, spotted fur on its body. They have evolved this lifestyle on the Scarlands due to its history. When humans abandoned the world of Piraeus, the Scarlands had much more tree cover during their heyday, which has slowly eroded from forest to open grassland with stands of trees in between, and forced this ancestrally arboreal species to spend more and more time on the ground. Their most notable adaptation, however, is their high tolerance to venom, which makes them very dangerous to the giant spiders and swarm trigger-happy nurse wasps that call their region home. Another opossum that frequents the Scarlands during the wet season is a northern jungle resident known as the Black False Quoll, a large cat-like marsupial that couldn't be more different from the Marauder Opossum. They are sleek, with long tails for balance and more conical teeth. Their hunting strategy is crushing a vulnerable part of their prey's body with these teeth and a surprisingly strong bite force. They leave when the dry season occurs, going northward to places where they are more common. One of the mammalian predators of the monsoon scarlands that is a threat to young tarim antelopes and other swift prey alike is the caped koi dog. Their thicker jaws and snouts allow them to easily dispatch a young tarim if left alone alongside their pack tactics. Koi dogs are monogamous, raising four to seven pups a year. The highly bonded couple make a daring double threat to any small or large prey species in the region. These large canids often will scavenge when prey is not readily available, capable of breaking bones in a carcass to access the marrow inside. Mere predators and prey aren't the only ecosystem definitions of mammals on the monsoon scarlands. Ecosystem engineers are also working hard to make the land better for all life forms. One such example is the armored paw bear, a heavyset generalist that eats invertebrates tubers, and carcasses. They will frequently steal kills from caped koi dogs and have an advantage in this encounter. Paw bear's armor and giant paws mean they have the defense and the attack that koi dogs would rather not challenge over the corpse of a rotting sheep. The way these bear descendants are ecosystem engineers due to their digging behavior. During a wet season, paw bears will till hundreds of acres of land, 
looking for ants or other arthropods hiding underground in the heat of the day. Due to this behavior, plants have an easier time to germinate and grow due to the soil being much more soft than it would be without pawbears around, making them key to these plants' survival. Another ecosystem engineer that is key to the survival of the Scarland stands of forests and permanent water bodies is the oasis beaver, which eats aquatic plants and trees. Small groups of one to four monogamous pairs and their offspring will form dams made of fallen trees and debris, which creates artificial lakes that can last for most of, if not the entirety, of the dry season. These habitats allow small fish species to last year-round and can provide key drinking water for wanderers going northward or southward. These animal-made artificial lakes have caused specialists to live in these waters. Outside of fish, of course, there are two mammals that make opportunities out of these water bodies. One such mammal is the white-headed hornster, a capybara descendant that, due to the lack of change in their immediate environment, have resulted in them changing very little. They eat grasses and fruits, and show an interesting degree of sexual dimorphism. The trait that makes them unique from their ancestors is the two large, keratinized horns above their nostrils. Hornsters have a pretty large level of male-to-male -male aggression, causing these animals to form very small groups in the wet season, but congregate en masse to the artificial lakes during the dry season, where there is less water around causing these animals to be less picky in who they reside with. Another aquatic specialist is the most bizarre mammal in the region. The river mole has features that allow it to be a good swimmer and tunneler. Their nose has become a trunk that allows it to act as a snorkel. They have terrible eyesight and rely on long whiskers and a strong sense of smell to compensate. They eat plants, invertebrates, and small fish, and are often preyed upon by other animals. During the wet season, they can be found in ephemeral water bodies across the region, but in the dry season, they are often found in the soil or in the artificial oases of the Scarlands. The mammals have carved a niche for themselves, but aren't the only ones that roam the waters of the monsoon lands. One fish that calls the region home is a humble algae eater, the Dollar Shiner. This small fish is primarily prey to other animals, so it frequently finds itself hiding among debris, by dams or covered in aquatic grasses. This small fish has eggs with thick membranes that allow it to survive the dry season when the river dries up. Another small fish that belongs to the Scarlands is the rather amusingly named Barbecue Discus, a near circular shaped fish that is a dedicated omnivore. Their ancestors experienced many droughts on Earth, and that made them pre-adapted for such an environment, so they have not changed too much from their Earthling ancestors. By far the largest fish in the monsoon region is the striped puddlefish, which can reach remarkable sizes of over 50 kilograms and lengths of up to 4 meters. They are bottom feeders that eat plankton, 
small invertebrates, and stuff at the bottom of lakes and rivers. Their strong rostrum on their faces allow them to be efficient at digging around, which incidentally causes the depths to be made deeper than they would be without the puddlefish around to feed. They can make it to 40 years of age, but rarely do so, as they tend to lay up to 200,000 eggs at a single time, the vast majority of which will not make it to adulthood. They can often be found in oasis beaver lakes in the dry season, deepening the water and allowing more space for themselves and other fishes. One of the aquatic predators of the flooded forests is the monsoon moray, a girthy, three meter long water monster with a maw of needle-like teeth. This freshwater fish eats other fish and baby alligators. It can sometimes catch birds out of the air by flinging itself out of the water like a spring. Their skin can absorb oxygen, allowing this animal to sometimes crawl, like a snake, from water body to water body during the dry season to find more food. The bodyguard catfish is the most specialized aquatic predator around. Spiny and toxic, these fish are dangerous to take down for small and big predators alike. But these guys aren't exactly the best hunters. They do best when they tail puddlefish and snap at whatever fish or moles the puddlefish digs up on accident. They have lost all but one pair of their barbels, using their vision primarily to hunt, especially when no puddlefish are around. The fish have carved out complex niches for themselves, from generalists to specialists to ecosystem engineers. But some of the most crazy adaptations must be credited to the reptiles. The reptiles of the Scarlands are incredibly diverse, each with their own suites of characteristics that make them extremely unique to the region on the planet many being found nowhere else on the world. The skunk turtle is a spiny, medium-sized turtle that is rather territorial and armed to the teeth with defenses that make them difficult prey to take down. One such trait is the spines that run on the back of the animal, which would be rather painful to the touch. The other, more potent power is the cocktail of chemicals the skunk turtle has stored up in its cloaca. When threatened, especially by a mammalian predator, the skunk turtle releases this horrid musk with a scent so bad it can incapacitate predators. The males are highly territorial and will only abandon their turf if it dries up in the dry season. They reach sexual maturity at four to five years old and can live almost to a century, especially given the low population density and lower levels of predation. Another shelly animal that lives among the region is yet another ecosystem engineer in the form of a tortoise. The lock-necked gopher is a long-necked tortoise descendant that creates gargantuan nests and burrows in high ground areas that don't often get flooded during the wet season. Females and males stay within a few hundred feet of their burrows and have long legs for a tortoise that allow the animal to have a surprisingly fast short sprint if attacked by a predator above ground fast enough to usually allow the organism to run back into their burrows. When there's not a lot of food available by a burrow, the tortoise will dig a small depression in an area surrounded by plants, 
allowing the Loch Neck to feed in a 360 degree range in relative safety. Other animals, especially small mammals like the marauder opossums or young hornsters, will enter their giant burrows for protection against the koi dogs. The Loch Neck will tolerate their presence given they don't target the eggs of this bizarre tortoise. An animal that will sometimes find itself in these giant burrows is the oatmeal monitor, a Nile monitor descendant that eats mainly insects but will go after carcasses or fallen birds if given the opportunity. During the dry season, this animal is less active, choosing to hunt at night and targeting spiders and other venomous prey. During the wet season, the oatmeal monitor is much more open, being commonly visible during the day. This monitor gets its name due to the black and white pattern resembling a rather interesting pot of oatmeal. Another lizard here is new to the skies, but a very courageous glider. To cope with the stands of trees being separated by hundreds of feet of grasses or rivers, the wyvern skink has evolved a gliding surface on their front limbs that allow the animal to glide for a few hundred feet. These aren't true flyers yet, being cold-blooded animals that rely on external heat to run properly, fly, or swim. Given the tropical Scarlands is very hot year-round, they are in a very welcoming location for a reptile. Around 25 centimeters long, these animals can swim, climb, and glide very effectively making them one of the most challenging animals to catch for a predator. Something the wyvern skinks have to be careful to avoid in the waterways when they take a dip is the giant pointed gator, a crocodile looking alligator descendant that is dangerous to a whole host of animals from a very young age. When young, these animals have long garia-like snouts that they use to catch fish and large bugs that get too close to the water. When they age, their snout becomes more wide with stronger jaw muscles that allow the animal to attack larger prey. As adults, they can reach lengths of 20 feet and weigh in at one and a half tons. They tend to halt growth during the dry season, lowering their metabolic levels to just surviving through the harsher times, but will be more active hunters during the wet season to compensate. Their favorite prey is the wandering sheep, who come in such large numbers that some will be lost from the herd, making them most vulnerable to these animals. All of these life forms are not all of the diversity of the region, but compose of the most relevant animals at this time period. They have all survived and changed the ecosystem for the better, becoming unrecognizable to the humans that left the planet so long ago. But in the next episode, we examine a forest of giants. Next episode, we take a deep dive into the Great Forest, a region of great diversity and size. Many thanks to Soros Blood and Hinsky Maslow for helping me with this video. The former helping me with the script this time around, and the latter providing many art pieces that were very useful for the production of this video. Without either of them, this episode would have taken much longer to produce. You can follow Hinsky on his DeviantArt account, and if you do so, tell him I sent you. If you want to help these videos come out more often, you can subscribe or join the Discord server, links in the description and the pinned comment.